right. Well, good morning to you and uh, welcome. If, if this is your first time at Calvary Chapel Hayward, um, I'm Pastor Paul. I'm a real person. I'm not a two-dimensional person. I'm real. I just, I'm a little bit sick. I've been sick for the last few days and didn't feel 100% today. And rather than trying to get you guys sick, I figured, well, this is easy enough. I'm here alone Saturday at the church uh, pre-recording this message instead of uh, trying to ask somebody to teach for me at the last second. So anyway, uh, as I said, if it's your first time here, uh, come back. I'd love to meet you. Um, but anyway, for everybody else, you know how this works. Pretend like I'm not on this flat screen. Pretend like I'm there in the the real pulpit. And pretending that means uh, we're going to uh, get into our message. So that means let's stand together. Okay? Yes, let's stand together. And we're in John chapter 1. We're going to wrap up the chapter today. We're going to start at verse 35 and read to the end and study to the end of the uh, chapter. So John 1, 35. <clears throat> Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. One of the two heard John speak and followed him as one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. <clears throat> now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And Father, we thank you once again for your word, for revealing yourself in so many good ways. Uh, Lord, help us to understand, help us to see things in your word. Open our eyes, open our understanding, open our hearts that we might be renewed in our minds by the study of your word. For your glory, for your honor, so we'll love you more, so we'll obey you better, so we'll honor you with our lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So here in our passage today, we get to see some of uh, Jesus meeting some of his first uh, disciples. Um, sometimes when we, when we read the other Gospels um, and we see, you know, like Jesus walking by the sea and seeing uh, uh, um, James and John or, or them and saying, follow me, 
it it would appear that like that's the first time he'd ever seen him and you know taken alone it looks like they're just you know he, they're just working they're doing their jobs and all of a sudden Jesus shows up and they'd never seen him before and he says follow me and like zombies without even question they just follow him uh, this gives us more insight as it relates to that. These are some of the first meetings, like when he actually met them. <clears throat> and uh, they become his disciples uh, after this. But right away, you can see there's kind of a, uh, well, we'll see. It looks like they really do right away. They're impressed. They're drawn to. They're uh, blessed to, in the, even in their first encounters with Jesus. And so they become disciples. A disciple is a student who follows not only a teaching, but a teacher. They don't just follow what the teacher teaches. They follow the life of the teacher. That's what a disciple is. When Jesus was here in the flesh, he wanted and sought after disciples, followers, and then he gave them different roles. And some 12 of those disciples became apostles. Those are guys that he entrusted specifically with uh, a greater ministry and he sent them out. But now that Jesus is no longer here in the flesh, he hasn't stopped seeking disciples. He still wants people who follow his teaching and follow him. And so that's what this passage shows us. It shows us how people began to meet him uh, as they became, and then they became acquainted with him and started right away becoming his disciples. And so that's what we're gonna look at. So verse, 35, it says again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. So we, we, we talked a little bit about John the Baptist last time. That was kind of the main gist of our passage last time. John the Baptist, of course, was the forerunner for Jesus. John also had disciples. He had guys that uh, he taught and followed him on his own. And they learned from John as they spent time and follow, with him and followed him. They, and, and the main focus we're going to see in a minute that what they learned from John was that I'm not the ultimate person you're supposed to be following. That there's somebody else coming, somebody else that I'm going to, God sent me to point out. And, and when you see him and, and learn of him, you need to follow him. John made that very clear. Um, but until that, that time come, that time came. Uh, so John's their teacher. They are disciple. They are his disciples. And until the time when uh, John points Jesus out to them, they only heard about Jesus. Jesus was only uh, someone that they had theoretical knowledge of. But then on this day, right here in verse thirty-five, John is standing there with a couple of his disciples. And John saw Jesus, and he said, take a look. That's what behold means. Take a look. That's him. That's the Lamb of God. And it says, verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. I have to say, verse 37 is one of my greatest desires as a Bible teacher, if not the greatest desire I have as a Bible teacher, as someone who speaks to others. It's very simple, it's true, it's my desire. When you hear me speak, more than anything else, I want you to follow Jesus. That's what I want. More than, I want you to do that more than anything else. I want that more than you liking me. I want that more than you, you know, uh, being able to follow along and, I want that more than, you know, laughing at my jokes. Uh, I want that more than you listening to the teaching and, and feeling good or, you know, feeling like that was what you needed or, or more than, I, I want that way more than you complimenting the sermon. I don't mind if you do that, but I hope it's because, you know, you feel like the Lord spoke to you. I, I want that. I want that more than you agreeing with every word I say or perfectly lining up with all the interpretations I've given of the passage. I want you to follow Jesus. And, and that, that, that what you hear from this pulpit, hear this. If you hear nothing else, anytime you come, 
that you walk away here going, I want to follow Jesus more. I want, I'm going to follow him more. I'm going to follow him as Lord and Savior. That's the best way you can respond to the teaching that happens here. Follow Jesus. Anyway, when John pointed out the Lord to those two disciples, that's what they did. They immediately left John and they followed Jesus. And what that means is that John did a really good job of making that clear and they did a good job of understanding that and learning what John taught them. I'm sure they liked John. I'm sure they enjoyed being his disciples. I'm sure they, there was something even where it was like, okay, well, I guess this is it, John. But up to that point, <clears throat> they got to hang out with John. And, and, and everything they heard about Jesus, again, it was just academic and theoretical. But at this point, everything changed because now they see Jesus. Now they get to go after him. Now the, the, what, they, what, what they only theorized about became practical and practice. I remember... Uh, taking chemistry in high school and in college didn't do well in it because I wasn't a good student. But chemistry is one of those uh, classes where there's often two parts to the class, usually, at least from, from what I took. There's the lecture and there's the lab. In the lecture, the teacher, the professor, he speaks about you know, principles and ideas of chemistry, the, the facts, the formulas, all these types of things. You know, uh, the math involved and all that. And we read about things and we looked at uh, diagrams and charts and you know different things like that. And, and we looked at the formulas and all that kind of stuff. And there was a lot to learn. But there's a limit what you can learn in the lecture. So that's why there's the other part. There's the lab. That's where you go in and you, know, you put on gloves, maybe some eye protection. You get out some, some beakers and Bunsen burners or whatever else and you get the different things and you you start mixing stuff together and you start th see things happening. It actually happens. You see what is done and it becomes, that's where the theory becomes hands-on. That's where the, the, the lecture becomes real. And the day these guys left John to follow Jesus, that's what they were doing. They were stepping from the lecture to the lab. And that's what Jesus is looking for when he looks for disciples. He wants us to have more than a theoretical knowledge of him, more than a head knowledge, more than an academic knowledge, more than a, I can answer lots of trivia questions knowledge. He wants us to have a practical, experiential knowledge. And that, and that only comes by walking with him. It, it, you know, go, go, leaving, leaving the time of teaching lecture and going out and putting into practice what has been taught in, in the movie uh, It's a Wonderful Life, the main character, George Bailey. There's one night and he, he's, uh, he tells the girl, Violet, um, that he's going to the library. And she says to him, Georgie, aren't you tired of just reading about things? And, and it's something like that with the Lord. He doesn't want us to just read about it as his disciples. He doesn't want us just to have our heads filled. He, he, he wants us to do something, to get our hands dirty, to, to do something and, and walk in it and not only read. James said it this way. He said, we shouldn't just be hearers only of the word. We should be doers of it. And following Jesus should mean there is something to do. It, if, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't listen and that, you know, all this, you know, meeting weekly or twice a week and hearing sermons is, we don't need that. We need that. He gave, he gave uh, the, the ministry of pastor teachers for a reason. But our listening should always lead to some action, to actively applying and following. And it says, they looked at Jesus as he walked. That's what it says. He was walking already. And they looked at him while he was walking, and they went after him. And that's interesting, because we're not, we're not looking to walk and do something practical that Jesus isn't doing. We're following him after what he's already doing. Jesus is already walking in all the ways that he teaches us to walk. 
He's already on the move. And he just wants us to go with him and follow after him. And, and, there's a, and he's, he's walking everywhere. He's, he's going everywhere. He's walking in your marriage. He's walking in your home and your parenting and your work and your friendships. And, and, and so if you hear a teaching on these things, you know, if you hear some issue, some point in the message that tells you how to be a better parent, he, he wants you to walk in that, to do it, uh, how to be a better spouse. That he's, that's something to do. How to, how to have a better worth at work ethic, how to be a better example of him at your workplace. That's a marching order. That's not just something for you to go, okay, now I know that. When he talks about conquering sin, when he talks about holy living, he means that to be something that we do in our lives. We're taught these things so that we can do these things. J James said also that the one who only hears and doesn't do is self-deceived. So biblical knowledge without biblical living is deceived living. Disciples don't just hear, they do. Verse 38. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, what do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? So Jesus notices these two guys f start following him. And so he turns and he asks them, what do you seek? In other words, what do you want? What do you, why are you following me? What do you hope to get out of this? And there's a lot of different ways these guys could have answered. Uh, they already had some idea about Jesus from John. They already believe that he's worth following. They uh, believe enough that John said he's the Messiah, that he's the Christ, to at the very least go find out if it's true. If not, they already believe it. And the simplest thing they could have said was, well, we, we, we were told you're the Messiah and we want to find out if that's true. Or we were told the Messiah, you're the Messiah and, and we want you to, we want to follow, we want to be taught by you. And, and so that's what they could have said. Now this question from the Lord is a good question, not only for them, for, but for every single person who uh, even begins to go look into what Jesus is about. It's a good question for each of us to answer ourselves, not just once, all, either, just maybe more than once, uh, from time to time, often. What do we seek? Why are we here? Why do we read about Jesus and study his life? Why do we open this Bible that he says is the word of God? What are we looking for? What do we want from him? Do we want his help? Do we want blessing? Do we want a better life? Do we want life to be easier? Do we want him to make our problems go away? What do we want? And so, so Jesus asked that, you know, what do you seek? And all they could come up with an answer was, all they could come up with as an answer was, what, where are you staying? Now, I think that they probably were just surprised and caught off guard a little bit by the question. Like, you know, maybe it was so sudden that John said there he is, and they had been planning this for so long that when we find him, we're going to follow him, that they hadn't really given too much thought to what if he asks us, what, you, what do we want? And so I, I just think they just thought, said the first thing that popped into their heads. That's, that's my opinion. But Jesus, you know, took their answer and went with it and gave a very gracious invitation. They said, you know, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. And it says they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. So again, he invited them to come and see where he was staying because that's what they asked for. But they got far more than just that out of it. They got come and see him because in going where he, they got to, they ended up seeing where he was staying and it was a little late in the day. It's the 10th hour is about four o'clock. And what it sounds like it says is they got the thrill of spending the rest of the day with him, possibly even staying the night. It, it's not super clear, but, but they did. It wasn't just like, okay, here it is. So, you know, 
all right, nice meeting you guys. It, they got to hang out. And, you know, throughout his time on earth, many, many people went to Jesus. That it, it tells us over and over in the Gospels that multitudes thronged him. They were all about, he became extremely famous. And it makes sense that he was, I mean, all the good things that he was doing. But they, <clears throat> the, most of these people wanted what he could do for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all want that. I want what Jesus can do for me. I, I'm sure you do too. But, but very few wanted to just hang out. Very few just spent this kind of intimate time with him. A whole day and an evening just hanging out with Jesus. And we're going to find out in chapter 2 that he hadn't even done any public miracles yet. These guys just wanted to be with the one that they were told is, is the, the one to be with, the Messiah, the Savior. And, and no doubt, even without any miracles, they probably had the greatest day of their life, these couple of guys. But, but understand this very simple thing that not only did they want this, but Jesus wanted it. I mean, look how easily he just welcomed it. Just right away. I mean, imagine if you're reading this the first time, you don't know much about Jesus, you're reading this story, and you're like, wow, he was so welcoming. And, and they wanted to be with him, but he wanted them with him too. And, and that's still true. Jesus wants disciples who love being with him. Mark uh, 3.14 tells us Jesus appointed the 12, it says, that they might be with him. That's the first thing it says about it. That why, did he, why did he pick the 12? So they could be with him. And, and we may come to the Lord with lots of needs, great needs. We all do. And, and we look to him because he's our great hope. And he he's gladly receives us with our needs. He even said, cast all your cares on me. You know, it says, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. He graciously and compassionately, you know, blessed and touched and healed everyone who came to him while he was here in the, in the flesh. But he also welcomes those who just want to be with him. He doesn't disappoint as it relates to that. He didn't disappoint these guys. He doesn't disappoint us. He's very interested in disciples who want fellowship with us with him. He, did, he doesn't save just to make us religious students, but he saves us and makes us his friends who get to have fellowship with him. Think of another guy, Zacchaeus, the wee little man. Remember, he went up into the tree because he wanted to see Jesus. And, and what did Jesus say to him? He said, hey, Zac Z Zacchaeus, come down. You need a lot of doctrine taught to you, and I want you to sign up for my class. And, you know, no, he didn't say that. He said, hey, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to come to your house. I just want to come to your house. And, and, of course, in that, Zacchaeus learned so many amazing things right away. But, but he learned them from being a friend to the Lord and the Lord being a friend to him, not taking the class and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Jesus is... Uh, is not a principle to follow. He's not a religion to join. He's not the, the, the fix-it guy to fix uh, all our fixings. He isn't a genie in a lamp to run to when I need another wish. He's the Lord of love. He's uh, a person looking for people who want to have fellowship with him. Following Jesus should first and foremost be relational. If you let him do that in your life, if you let him be your friend, he'll be the greatest friend you've ever had. And, and there's no greater reason than that. You don't need a bunch of other reasons. You Again, come to him with your needs. but And come to him knowing he's, he's uh, eager to help you with all, whatever you need help with. But just hanging out with him is sweet. And... Uh, he wants that as, as for you as his follower to have fellowship with him. Verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first 
found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So we're told here that one of the two disciples of John that followed Jesus that day was Andrew. And, and Andrew was so thrilled about the time that he got to spend with Jesus and just that, even that initial getting to know him, <clears throat> that the first chance he had, he went and told his brother Simon all about him. He absolutely was convinced so that what he said was to, to Simon, uh, Simon Peter, he's not called Peter yet, he will be in the next verse, uh, we have found the Messiah. And, and verse 42 again says, and he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. So apparently what Andrew said was enough to at least get Peter, Simon Peter, to go meet Jesus. And right away, uh, Jesus clearly likes Peter, gives him a nickname right away. Uh, he says, you're going to be called Rocky. You know, it says, uh, it's translated as stone or rock. Cephas there is the Aramaic, Aramaic word for stone. We know him as Peter because Peter's the Greek translation of the same name. And so the, Jesus uh, spoke uh, Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew. The common time, most of the speaking was in Aramaic, but the Bible was written in Greek. And so that's why we know him as Peter. And so his name was Simon, but he's going to be called Peter. So sometimes he's called Simon Peter. Notice the effect that Jesus so quickly has on these two brothers. Look at how quickly Andrew is like, I, somebody else, I got to get other people to meet Jesus. He'd only known Jesus for a short time, but he brought Peter. And, and, and Andrew then, you know, if we look around at other parts of the, the uh, Gospels, Andrew becomes known for bringing people to Jesus. He was the, Andrew was the same person who brought the boy with the five loaves and the two fish that Jesus multiplied to feed the, the, the thousands. He brought, here we, he brought Peter to Jesus. Uh, later in John, he's, Andrew brought some of the first Greeks who would believe in Jesus to Jesus. And so Andrew wasn't the only one to, to, to do this, but he was one of the first ones. Uh, the rest of the passage, other people are doing the same thing, though. In verse 43, the, in the passage, we got a lot of finding of others going on. In verse 43, it says, Jesus found Philip. In verse 45, it says, Philip found Nathanael. And you could even say that John the Baptist found some because he had disciples who, who maybe he found them. And then God sent him to, in a sense, find Jesus, yes, by the power of the Holy Spirit, but nonetheless, he found him. And so people met Jesus in a variety of ways, but don't let it escape your notice that most of the meetings of Jesus happened when one person found another person, one person found a family member, one person found a friend. The only, the only time that in this passage, and really in most of this, that it happened a different way was when uh, John, who's uh, a minister, points out Jesus to some of his students. And I say that to, to help you to know, and you really should know this. There's a far greater likelihood that you can introduce someone that you know to Jesus, just introduce him, than that because I'm a pastor, that I'm going to introduce all Jesus to all the, or, or all the people that you know to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes you just want to bring people to church. Why? So that I will introduce them to Jesus. And I, hopefully I do. Anytime new, somebody new comes here, I think we talk about Jesus quite a bit here. He's, he's everything to us. But there's a far greater likelihood that you will introduce people that you know, your friends, your family, 
to Jesus. Introduce him. You're not, you're, we talked last time. You're, you're, it's not your job to save these people. Just introduce him. And that's how it happened. Anyway, even in these early encounters with Jesus, which were true encounters, these men were uh, changed immediately, e- even if it, in small ways. They, they immediately start, whether they realize this is what's happening to them or not, they start becoming useful in the kingdom of Jesus by the mere bringing of other people to meet him. And, and that's what happens when you become a disciple of Jesus. That he wants, to, he wants to, his disciples to be people that he used. Yes, to be friends, but also to be useful to him. And, and, and anyone who follows Jesus can be useful to him, even without any formal instruction or training, but it's just naturally, organically, You can become friends with anyone. If you become real friends, eventually you're going to introduce that friend to other friends and family members. And that's that's how this works, too. That we don't, you know, we're not, we don't have to be, all of our usefulness to the Lord doesn't have to be out of some sense of duty, um, but out of our own just blessed excitement that we know someone awesome. And, and Andrew told Peter because he was excited that he met someone awesome. And so he just met the most wonderful person he'd ever met. And it so moved him, he had to tell his brother. And so Andrew was useful to the Lord from the start, and we can be too. Jesus wants disciples, and he wants to use them. He wants to use us, and he can use us right away just by means of us hanging out with him. So you want to look for that in your life. Uh, Verse 45, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Now, if we remember back in verse uh, 28, which we uh, studied last time, uh, it said that John was this whole all that we're reading about happened in Bethabara. And that was, that was in the kind of the deserty area, just at the northern tip of the Dead Sea. Galilee is the region north of there. If you go upstream uh, from the um, uh, upstream of the Jordan River from this Dead Sea, you'll hit the Sea of Galilee. And the, the northern part of Galilee is where Jesus did so much of his ministry. Um, Capernaum being one of the main towns, um, but just a little bit to the east of Capernaum is uh, this other town, uh, Bethsaida, and we're told that's where some of these guys were from, and so it's a good journey from where, and it says Jesus wants to go to, to Galilee, and he wants to go up there, and so he finds Philip, and we don't know how that interaction happened. Maybe he just, you know, Jesus is clearly a people person, meeting people, and he finds out Philip's from up there, and he's like, well, come with me up to, up to Galilee. And, uh, and so they, they make this journey together, and it, it's, a, it's a distance. About if, you, if they went all the way up to, say, Bethsaida, where Philip was actually from, that's a good 75 miles. And so it, it's a distance. It's going to take some days. And the Lord wanted company, and Philip was from there. And Philip's like, yeah, uh, I'll go. And so he went, and he had this awesome time with the Lord. And then verse 45 says, Now Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Just like Andrew, after his first time with Jesus, Philip is thrilled. He's excited. He and... uh, he went to tell someone, he told his friend Nathaniel, we found him, and, and one trip, and Philip was convinced, again, just like Andrew, of who Jesus, uh, that Jesus was uh, the Messiah. And verse 46, and Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Now, Philip's 
disdain, or I'm sorry, Nathaniel's disdain for Nazareth uh, makes sense. Nazareth wasn't thought highly of it, wasn't really thought much of at all. Nazareth was an out-of-the-way town, very little there, uh, not easy to get to. It wasn't one of these towns that, like, you know, is near something that people would want to get to. It's not by the Sea of Galilee. It's not by the Great Sea. It's not anywhere along the Jordan River. It's between the Sea of Galilee and the Great, and the, the Great Sea and being the Mediterranean. Um, it's extremely hilly all around it. There's no major roads. There were no major roads that went through it. It wasn't the kind of town that you would pass through. It was an out-of-the-way, hard-to-get-to place. And historians speculate that probably only about three or 400 people lived there during the time of Jesus. If it's not for Jesus growing up, we'd probably never have ever heard of it. But he grew up there. And so Nathaniel, hears, he's heard of it, but he's like, Nazareth? What's up with that? There's nothing good coming from there. But, but Philip knew how awesome Jesus was already, and he really wanted Jesus or Philip, uh, Nathaniel to meet him, so he didn't want to argue about Nazareth. He probably agreed, yeah, I know, I know, Nazareth, I know, but you got to meet this guy. you got to come and see. I know it's Nazareth, but come and see. And, and as a follower of the Jesus, any follower of Jesus, we can all kind of get the, the gist and heart of Philip here and agree with him. That whatever it is that someone who doesn't know Jesus yet, whatever it is, whatever preconceived idea that makes them go, oh, I don't know about that. We just want them, if we could just convince them just come and check it out. Just give it a chance. Just give him a shot. Give him a listen. Give him a, the, just taste and see the Lord is good. I, I'm, I don't need to argue with you, with you about all your, you know, hang-ups as to why you don't think it could be. Just come and look. Man, we so just want that. We're if we know him, we know that's all it would take. An honest look. An honest chance. Just give him a taste. Now, we, we can't bring him, uh, our friends to Jesus physically. So their taste of Jesus is going to have to come through us. Through our being like him. And so we want that. We want to be like that. Lord, help us to be like that. Anyway, Philip told Nathaniel, come and see. And, and uh, now that's a phrase we've ar ar also already seen in our passage earlier, right? Come and see. Jesus said it in verse 39 to those first two who followed him that came after him from John. And, and I, I think, I mean, I, I think maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe whatever, but I think it's a fair speculation to, that Philip's time with Jesus was already rubbing off on him. That he said, come and see, because maybe he heard Jesus say, Come and see. And uh, back again to when it says that Jesus appointed the 12, that he might be with them. It also says that, that he might send them out to preach. When, when Jesus is looking for his disciples, it's first so that they can be with him in, in fellowship and friendship eternally, an eternal relationship. But secondly, in order to make us like him. So that we can do what he does. So that, and, and, you know, so that we can, you know, when he was in the, when Jesus was in the flesh, he was limited to a, a single geographical place at a time. And then, and then when he uh, uh, died and rose again and ascended into heaven, he gave us the Holy Spirit so that we can let, be like him, we're his body now and do what he does. And, and, and so he teaches us to be like him. And so when Philip says, just like Jesus had said earlier, come and see, I kind of see in that a little bit of that, that Philip's already, already being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Jesus wants disciples that he can duplicate himself in. That's what he's looking to do in us. It says in Romans 8, 29, for 
For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus wants to make us like him in as many ways that he can. And, and he's doing it here in Philip. He wants to do it in us because this world has no greater need than Jesus. The world needs his salvation, his way of life, his teaching, his love, his grace, his compassion, his touch. He is what human beings are supposed to be like. And, G- and Jesus himself knows that he's what the world needs. And so that's why he wants to make us like him, to make us like him so that we can give him to the world. And in that way, we, we, uh, we're, that's part of what a, a disciple is. We, we need his character and his methods and his way applied to our lives we need his grace and his patience and in our relationships. We need his honesty and his diligence in our work. We need his love and faithfulness in our marriages. We need his humility in dealing with other people, hard people. We need his ways in winning others. We need to be like Jesus, and that's what he wants to do in us as his disciples. Let's let him do it. Lord, make us like you. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. The word deceit is interesting. Some translations say guile. It's literally the word Jacob. Now you remember, maybe you remember Jacob from the Old Testament. Abraham's son, Abraham's uh, grandson came through Isaac and then Jacob. His name meant, means heel catcher, supplanter, or deceiver. And, and we, if you remember the story, he tricked his brother out of his birthright. He tricked his dad to, into blessing him instead of his brother Esau. Later on, he even tricked his brother again when he had that re- reunion with his brother Esau. And, and they were reunited and reconciled with each other and Esau said, yeah, come, come where I am. And he said, go ahead, I'll catch up with you. And then he went the other way, still deceiving there. And, and so he was a first-class trickster, Jacob was. And Jesus says to Nathaniel here, you're an Israelite who has none of that in you. You're an Israelite, but you're no Jacob. That's what he's saying. And in other words, he's not saying you're sinless. He's saying you're sincere. You're, you're genuine. You're not a fake or a con. And, and, and it even shows when uh, Nathaniel earlier said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was just being honest. He wasn't going to try to say something polite. Just to, he just given an honest opinion. And then it says, Nathaniel said to him, well, how do you know me? Nathaniel doesn't deny Jesus' assessment of him. All he did was he wondered how he knew it. How, how do you know something about me so personally? I mean, you've, we've never met. He, he, by saying that, Nathaniel clearly says, you, you, you got me good. I mean, spot on. And Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, there's a lot of wild speculations about what, what, Nathaniel was doing under the fig tree and people have a lot of wild imaginations Um, I don't have a wild imagination I don't have much imagination at all Um, so I I just like to look what do we know and and I'll take one thing from historians historians say that fig trees were good places for Bible students or people that want to meditate on the scriptures to, to sit under you know they tend to be big they have broad leaves and provide a decent amount of shade there's a good number of them in that area uh, quiet and peaceful place to meditate and so maybe maybe Nathaniel was just quietly praying and studying God's word and and uh, and what we whatever else is going on again it's only a guess but what we do know is that Jesus said I saw you there I saw you there that's how I know true and genuine. I saw you when you were alone, 
and I know what you're really like, even alone. And Nathanael answered him and said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now that's why the speculation. Because it's like, it seems like a covenant, kind of a huge response. And, and again, Jesus knew more than that, but we don't. But whatever Nathanael was doing under that fig tree, Nathanael was thoroughly amazed that Jesus saw him doing it. And without ever, ever having personally met him before, knowing that about him, that you're no fake. And there's no human way that Jesus could have known that on his own. Philip and Nathanael walked up to Jesus at the same time. And there's no nothing about Philip going, hey, here's my buddy Nathaniel. He was under the fig tree, but I got him and brought him here. There's no way, there was no time or record of, of Philip saying, here's my buddy Nathaniel, uh, and, you know, he's no phony, he's no fake, you know, and uh, he didn't have any time to tell him. And, you know, he, he thought it was kind of crazy that you're from Nazareth, but we think you're someone special. There was no time for any of that. And Je- Jesus just says, there's no deception in you. You're not, you're not someone easily given to fantasy or d- clearly not easily swayed about the Messiah. And you're not someone to be dishonest for the sake of politeness. And, and Nathaniel's just amazed. How do you know me? These deep personal things in my private thoughts. You must be something more than a mere man. And that's what he concluded. He said, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel, the Messiah. It says in uh, Psalm 139, verse 1 to 3, Oh, Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. That's what Nathaniel experienced here in his first encounter with Jesus. And the only explanation to him, and it's true, is that Jesus is something else. He's more. He's divine. And Jesus has the same knowledge of you and of me. He knows you deeply. He knows you intimately. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the reason for the things you do and the things you think and the feelings that you feel far more than you do. He knows why you do what you do. He knows why you think what you think. And and in addition to that, because he became a man and was tempted in every way that you and I have been, he knows what it's like. He knows what you're going through. And it's so wonderful to think that not only does he know all that, but he still cares about you and he still loves you and he's still interested in you. And, 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 and he's able to help with all those issues. He knows why you get so worked up about certain things when not everybody else does. He knows why you're so prone to this temptation and not that And yet they're prone to that and not this. He knows that. He knows why you're afraid. He knows why you get so anxious. He knows when you're being fake and when you're being sincere. He knows those things in your life that are out of control. He knows your past and he knows your future. And the most glorious thing of all is that even though he knows all of that better than anyone else, he loves you. And he still wants you to be his disciple. He still wants you to be his follower. He still wants you to be his friend. He knows you and he has a great plan for you. Verse 50, Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. Jesus was blessed and pleased with Nathaniel's response. Man, all I did was told you I saw you under the fig tree and you believe me for something so little? If that little amount can convince you, then Nathaniel, you're in for a wonderful ride. You're going to be amazed. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Here Jesus was referring to Jacob's vision in uh, Genesis 28. Remember when after uh, Jacob deceived his brother Esau and his brother's like, I'm killing this dude. And he had to leave town. He had to run and he had nothing with him. And he 
was in the middle of nowhere and he was exhausted and he found a pillow and used or a rock and used it for a pillow and and he had a vision of of a ladder from heaven to earth and angels going up and down on it and and Jacob says man God's in this place I didn't even realize it and he named it Bethel or house of God and Jesus was talking about that referring to that when he said you're going to see amazing things like that Nathaniel you're going to see a supernatural interaction between heaven and earth as long as you hang out with me you're going to see a heavenly exchange and you're going to be blown away. <clears throat> I remember the first time, I don't know if you ever, I remember the first time I saw a 3D movie as a kid. You go in there and they give you those funky glasses, you know, the ones that when we first saw them, they were red, one eye was red, one eye was blue. And you look at the screen without them and it looks terrible. You don't see, you know, it just looks awful. And then you put those glasses on and it, it's amazing. And they, back when they made them when I was a kid, they would, they were, they'd have all the 3D tricks, the things that make you go, oh, look out, it's coming at you, and all that kind of stuff. And, but these things look like they're jumping off the screen, and the movie came alive. And for disciples of Jesus who have faith, who really trust him, that's how life works. It, things start to come alive. The Lord is already impressive to anyone interested to look into him. But when we believe him, when we really believe him, our heavenly vision expands. And we see things that there's no other way that we could see. You see things as a believer that unbelievers don't see, right? You see God working. You see it. You're like, that was totally the Lord. You see him helping you. You see him doing things. We, and we see our lives changed. We see miracles. We see transformations. And that's what happens when we believe him. When we see someone saved, we see a miracle. You see somebody else, uh, uh, somebody who doesn't believe in the Lord, they see someone saved, and they, they see someone uh, desperate who becomes a fanatic. They don't see the right thing. They're seeing two-dimensionally. And, but we see the hand of God. And, and the more we see that, the more we grow in faith, and then we see more. And Jesus is looking for disciples so that he can open our eyes and show us things that there's no other way we could see. And, and so put your trust in him as Lord and Savior. There's enough in the Bible to know Jesus is worth trusting in. But when you put your trust in him, your eyes will be opened so much greater. And he wants to do that in you. He wants to do that. Put your trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Trust that he died for you. And that through that death, he, your sins are forgiven. Believe that he rose again. And then, believing him, follow him. And just watch what he does. Just watch. You're going to see greater things than these, just like he said to Nathaniel. Believe in Jesus. If you've never believed in Jesus before, if you've never made a commitment to trust him as Lord and Savior, do that today. Make up your mind. Decide in your mind and your heart, I'm turning away from living my way. I'm turning away from my sin. And I'm looking to trust Jesus. And just to make it clear, Tell him that's what you're doing, Lord, and tell him that in your own words. Say something like this. Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my life. Be Lord of my life. I want to be your disciple, and I want to be saved. And he'll do that. He'll answer it. Father, thank you once again for your word. Thank you that you've given your son as our Savior, and he's looking for disciples, and that's what we want to be. We want to be disciples good. We love you. We praise you. And in Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand and we'll finish up with one closing song. God bless you. See you guys next time.